I'm going to do a talk on um, quite a basic talk, uh, high level on how you and how you go about sequencing SARS-CoV-2 um, with quite a lot of reference to the COG UK consortium. So the um, I was pondering this question last night and did and did a Twitter thread on this, but there's there's so that in COG UK at the moment we do a lot of um, nanopore sequencing, um, which tends to be quite rapid through, which is a, which is a rapid turnaround um, <clears throat> protocol up to 96 samples. But in parallel with that, there's also a number of high throughput methods, usually using Illumina sequencing. And we actually use um, two out of the three possible sort of broad, broad, broad classes of library of, of, of sequencing approach, which I would, which you would call metagenomics, um, which is untargeted RNA seq basically, um, and then two target two different classes of targeted methods, either amplicon sequencing or bait capture. Both of these are actually used in Cog UK, and it occurs to me that this model of decentralized network that we have it it draws in uh, a lot of expertise um, from from all over the from all over the UK. And that's actually what's led to the success of the project, having this broad base of uh, and diversity within the methods that's, that's allowed us to be what's been called in the press the best genomic surveillance system in the world. So that's uh, very gratifying to see that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm going a little bit off topic. So the Amplicon sequencing is what this talk is about. Um, you might have heard the, the names, the Arctic method, which is a sort of nickname. Um, for amplicon sequencing, um, <clears throat> it's it's become popular because it's quite cheap and easy to scale. Can and it can recover genomes or at least partial genomes in the um, in the cycle threshold thirty to thirty five range, which makes it ideal um, for some of, for for this kind of work, even in the presence of a, you know a high uh, host level. Um, and the way that it works is it uses in, in, in the nanopore context is it uses multiplex PCR to generate amplicon pools, which we then use native barcoding to barcode and sequence on nanopore. So <clears throat> you will have all heard of PCR. This is a, this is a, 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 a classic 1980s technique. Um, and obviously you start off with genomic DNA and then you have these first cycle products where you extend one piece, one primer, uh, and then you have a second, you have four second cycle products where you extend um, your reverse primer. The ones that, the ones that go exponential are this one uh, and this one. So after cycle two, it goes exponential. Um, <clears throat> but what we do in the um, multiplex PCR method, which as, as I was saying earlier, was, was born out of um, this, the Brazilian road trip where that photo of Nick in front of the bus was, we, um, we were struggling with CT, high CT values for the, Zika, for, for the Zika, clinical Zika virus isolates that we got. This is a plot showing the CT, the CT values from the RT, RTQPCR data that we collected on that, on that trip, showing that the modal CT value was about 36. And that is very high in terms of the number of copies. It's, it's, it's sort of in the 10 to 100 copies per, per mil range. It's quite low. So, um, so we were struggling with so we were struggling with that, and we and it actually so with the Ebola in the previous Ebola work we'd done singleplex um, RT um, one step RT RT PCR reactions pulled them and sequenced them, but we needed something which used less RNA um, and was faster and more high throughput. So we ended up with um, we ended up focusing on multiplex PCR where you generate all the amplicons in one reaction. The trick there is trying to make the reaction work. Um, all of those all of those single reactions work in the same in the same tube, and that led to um, me reverse engineering a technique developed by um, Thermo Fisher called AmpliSeq, which we call Primal Scheme. Um, my idea was that there wasn't really anything too complicated going on here, and it was purely a des primer design challenge, um, and then. Over, this is the latest iteration of the tool, which we call Primal Scheme, 
which is a web-based tool enabling you to design the primers to do this multiplex PCR. Um, and all you have to do is upload a fast A file of your references. And this can be multiple references from, from any virus. The tool is able to, to design the best primers over to cover the, the diversity of the reference genomes that you upload. Um, and this that's the sort of best, the sort of most most recent feature that we've added, me and Andy Smith, who developed this tool. Um, so all you really need to set is the amplicon size and the name, and the tool will start off. Um, it will apply a window over the over the beginning of the genome and then align all the references with Parasail to, to, to determine the sort of scar strings really. And then from that, it will choose the most conserved primers. If you want to, if you want to make it design primers against your first reference only, you can turn on the pinned, um, turn, the, turn on the pinned flag and then it will only produce products. It will only produce primers which occur in the first genome, which is sort of like the old, the old behavior for the people that have used this for, for a while. But, um, but then you generate, you get this output, um, which looks like this. And all of the primers you can see are the red box, the other sort of pink, are the sort of red boxes flanking these boxes. They show the 400 base pair um, target. It's the target 400 base pair um, amplicon length and then the primers are the, the red bits. And you, and you see the, because there's the line illustrates Above the line illustrates that it's a pool one, and below the line illustrates that it's a pool two primer. And that's because you can't actually mix the, there's an overlap between, between the primers, which means that you can trim off the primers, which are obviously synthetic oligos. Um, and you only consider the, the actual sequence from the, from the viral RNA, um, which, which is quite an important part, which we'll come back to later, because obviously this is the main consideration when you're doing the analysis of this type of data. But in terms of the PCR, you have to leave a gap between the amplicons because otherwise you would generate an overlap product. So for example, you would, um, you would preferentially, if you mix these primers together, you would preferentially produce a product between um, um, two left and, and one right, which would be a short product, which wouldn't cover any of the genomes. So we have to separate them out into two reactions. That said, the technique still does allow you to produce um, 96 amplicons in two reactions, which cover the, um, the 30,000 base pair genome. So it's quite um, high complexity in terms of the, 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 number of the number of reactions or prim primers in the reaction. Um, this is a, a, a plot showing what the data would look like. Um, this is actually um, Zika data. Uh, and the top is unnormalized and the bottom is normalized. So on the top plot, you can see the sort of natural variation that you get from the efficient from that occurs due to the differences in the uh, prime, the efficiency of the primer pairs, which obviously will, even though you try to make them very similar, can change. And then the overlaps, which are the, um, the you know, the higher coverage areas, sort of like the, the coverage of, of region one and two mixed together, basically, which, uh, which gives you this sort of like skyline plot. And then in the analysis pipeline, that gets normalized down so that you have um, some n number of coverage for all of the regions above that threshold. And then you end up with what we call dropouts, which is where you get no, no data for that particular point. That's because of application failure, um, which is an, an inevitable consequence of something like this, can be caused by um, poor primers or by mutations in the primer binding site, which could be caused by very, you know, you know, variation. Although that is um, you should, because of the overlap, you should still get the amplicon, the, the, the adjacent amplicon covering it, um, or you know, or you know, or or just high CT or degraded input material, which which lead to a gradual degradation of the reaction, more uh, and more and more dropouts towards the high CT samples. Um, so that's what the that's the the sort of key features of what the data looks like um, for SARS-CoV-2. The initial um, protocol release was on, I think the 23rd of January, I'm trying to remember now. Um, yeah, 23rd of January. So it's coming up to the first birthday of this protocol. Um, and uh, the, the, the genome that this, this, this is based on was actually the third version of the, um, of the genome, which was actually only released, I think on something like the 18th. So it's less than a week afterwards, which is what Nick was referring to earlier. Um, and then subsequently, we we changed the primer pairs, trying to, to trying to improve the dropouts. You can see this is a comparison between version one, two, and three. This dropout's been eliminated in version three. Um, 
you can see, and as, as has this one, 76, you can see that there are some stubborn um, primer pairs where adjusting the primer pairs hasn't, hasn't really improved the uh, coverage in those regions. And these are basically the troublesome regions that we still have now. So the, in order to make this more, in order to allow this more people to have access to these primers, um, I organized a bulk scale synthesis with IDT, um, which, was, which is manufactured and um, filled and packed by IDT and sent out from them, um, which, allows, which allows more consistency in the terms of the primer pairs that people use. And it's, and it's actually really cheap. They only, um, they only charge like $30 to do this, which is, um, which is, I think, partly because we've paid for the synthesis. So <laughs> I don't know if we're just buying, we've just bought it for everyone, but at least they, 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 they um, send it out to everyone, which is much more, con much more convenient. So if you want to order the primers, you can order the primers directly from IDT and they'll send them out to you um, for, the v, for the V3 pools, which is the only thing that's available. I got excited when I saw this picture in the, on the Guardian, but turned out that it was a, a tube of N-target PCR primers, not the one, not ours. So this is the protocol. Um, the, we use the plat Arctic network, use the platform called protocols.io for, um, for you know, sharing protocols. It's a, it's an, an online platform which allows people to post protocols, you know, open source protocols, and then comment, um, fork, um, um, update. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not full version history, which is the thing, uh, you know, it's not a full, it's not a full version tree, which like GitHub, which is what I don't like about it, but it is quite simple and basic, which I suppose is its strength. And it is, it has proven to be quite popular. Um, this, this is the third version, which are called low cost. Um, it's had over a hundred thousand views. Um, you can see that the comp this, this version has 60 comments. There's 433 comments across all the versions. So it allows you to interact with other people, um, other users and answer and, and answer each other's questions basically. So it's a good forum for troubleshooting. Um, it's also had something like 56 forks. So there are a number of sub protocols of this. Um, yeah, and in addition, it's been adopted commercially by other companies. So this is actually supported by ONT um, in their, they have a, they have, they will support this protocol through tech support. They also have a protocol on their website, um, which is, which is very much in line with this one. The um, Kyogen have commercialized a product for this. Illumina have commercialized COVID seat, which is based on, on the multiplex PCR primers. NEB have commercialized a kit which is called the Arctic Companion Kit. So it's been very, very widely adopted um, across the community. This is a plot from the preprint, um, just showing the, the, um, that the PCR is the PCR output or, the, G, or the, the, the genome recovered from the PCR is limited by the input cDNA. Uh, this is a dilution series of cDNA. So you can see that the less you put in, the more um, dropouts occur and, and degradation of the reaction. Um, you can see that this is, this is batched up by read number. So you, with increasing read number going left to right. So you can see that it sort of rolls over and then you don't see any more amplification after that. That's why we call them dropouts because no, no amount of coverage will rescue those amplicons. They're just not there. So that's why, that's why you get this sort of sigmoid shaped curve. And it also, it's a good way to sort of mentally think about how much sequencing you need because you can see that it's rolled over after you've generated, you know, a uh, hundred thousand reads per sample and, and you're not really going to achieve any more coverage than that, no, ma no matter how long you keep running that flow cell. So that's, that's one of the advantages and, and, and that's, sort of, and that will, and that's what sort of decision you can make about how long to run your flow cell for if you're using ramp up. So I'm going to quickly talk about how the, the, how this I've had already 20 minutes. So I'll quickly talk about how you set the lab up, but this is the, um, this is like the first, equipment that I took to um, West Africa for the Ebola outbreak. We've increased the amount of equipment now, but we've got a much better process. Um, and you can see this figures drawn by Ian Goodfellow here, showing the lab um, um, in um, DRC. Um, we've now got three separate um, isolation cabinets, we call them, but they're actually hydroponics tents, but different cabinets for different stages of the workflow. Um, we've got a pre-PCR cabinet um, 
a sample addition, um, a sample, sorry, this is post PCR, a sample uh, extraction and addition. So that's, that's sort of like semi clean. And then this is a master mix cabinet where no template at all would, would go in there. And each inside each of them, they have UV sterilization capabilities and their foil lines. So it reflects the UV. Um, and you can also use DNA um, sprays to try and clean them down. And this is an effective way of keeping amplicons <clears throat> contained even in a single lab setting like this is here, uh, which means that we can run, you know, the whole workflow in this sort of four by four meter lab um, with, with this amount of baggage. So two soft bags, two large bags, um, <clears throat> and that contains all of the cabinets as well as all the equipment um, and reagents required to do this. You can see all of, of Ian's very, very neat OCD packing, including power management system. And this is um, this is Rampart, which I'm not going to talk about because this will be covered in the next talk. But once you've set the run up, you can see the, the same Amplicon coverage profile that I was talking about earlier. Um, collection of reads, um, barcoding, barcoding by sample information. And this is this sort of rolling over curve that I was talking about earlier. So you can see um, which samples are likely to achieve saturation. Um, and then you can decide whether to carry on the sequencing or stop the sequencing. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and I'd like to thank all of the, all of the rest of the Arctic network um, and all of our collaborators who are listed there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so the, um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, so show your, show your appreciation for Josh in the usual way. You can choose any of the reactions if you like. Um, so uh, the, there was a question that I'm sure you'll enjoy answering from Farhad, which was, has there been any developments in the use of the direct RNA kit for viral nanopore sequencing? And I suppose maybe thinking about the use for kind of sequencing clinical samples for genomic epidemiology. I'd say that I'm, I'm not aware of, of, any, of any usage of direct RNA for SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's, it's limited on, I don't, can you, is there any, do you know? From isolates there, some examples aren't there? From isolates, oh yeah, there's the Australian paper from isolates. Yeah, so, so, there's, so the, there's a couple of limitations with the direct RNA kit. One is that it, it's poly A prime, so you, it's designed for messenger RNA. Um, and then it's got very high, um, and it has a very high requirement of uh, input. So it's, it's like, it's like a microgram of total RNA to get, or, or it's, it's, it's even more than that, isn't it? It's like 10 micrograms of total RNA to get at least um, 100 nanograms of poly A RNA. So it's, it's very high. It's, it's too high for, for, for practical use in a clinical, clinical um, uh, isolate setting. Um, obviously, the, the, the virus that you're sequencing needs to be polyadenylated. And if you don't, if it's not a polyadenylated virus, then you have to do additional polyadenylation steps, which reduce the efficiency even further. So um, there was, there was a, a nice proof of principle paper from the Australian group very early on in the outbreak, actually, showing the, um, showing the um, subgenomic RNA fragments using direct RNA. But other than that, um, and, 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 and using them to annotate the genome, but other than that, I'd say that there wasn't there wasn't, there hasn't been any, any, any major usage. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question uh, from Hassan is a practical one. So if you design a primer scheme um, with primal scheme, how do you prepare pool A and, and pool B after you've done that primer design? Yeah. So basically you, you get all of your primers in tubes or plates. I'd probably recommend tubes for most schemes because it's very, very difficult to um, avoid, you know, contamination if you're trying to do this with a multi-channel. I prefer to do it one tube at a time. And basically what you do is pull everything above the line into one tube and everything below the line into another tube in an equivolume fashion. So initially anyway, so You'd put, you'd put one, you'd basically take all of the e all of the odd tubes and all of the even tubes. So for the odd tubes, I mean one left, right, three left, right, five left, right, and put them into one rack and all of the even tubes, two left, right, four left, right, six left, right, into another rack. Basically take one at a time and just take five microliters from each one of your resuspended um, 
primers at 100 micromolar. Um, and then you can do rebalancing. So you can start off with equimolar pools, you can sequence them, and then you can rebalance them to try and make balance pools, and that will improve your, your genome completeness. Um, but you don't you but it's not possible to predict the efficiency of the reactions in advance so you have to do an equimolar pool first and then you have to sort of average it over a number of samples to get decent balanced pools this is a technique that um, has been done by a couple of different people Nate and um, the Sanger have done I've got this um, technique uh, for calculating the the weighting of each primer based on coverage which is available on the um, on protocols.io actually Excellent. And I think we'll put some links to um, protocols and, and the papers that, that you mentioned on the website so people can go and um, explore that more, including the link to Primal Scheme. Um, there was a question uh, from John Juma. Um, how do you use uh, Primal Scheme to design primers for segmented uh, viruses uh, where you have multiple uh, different yeah. um, nucleic acids? So this is like the feet, the next feature that I want to put in. It's not possible at the moment. You have to, well, it is possible to do segmented viruses where you just put all the segments in separately. But one of the, one of the um, functions in, in primal scheme in the primer, in the selection, in terms of the selection and the ranking algorithm is that it, it looks for um, heterodimer forming pairs in the same pool. So it considers every new primer candidate against all the previous prime selected primers within that pool um, for heterodimer st stability using the thermodynamic engine from primer three and it can't do that if you have separate runs so one of the things that we want to do and we want to add um, we will do this once once andy doesn't have a newborn baby um, and <laughs> and get some time to work on this is put in the ability to do segmented viruses it will also be able to be used for um, bacterial um, CGMLST panels as well if you do that or any panel really um, because you could you would just provide it with um, we'll, we'll change the the way that you put in the input files so that you can add multiple input files for each segment or each or each gene in the panel and then it will just run them as the same job and instead of like separating them into separate jobs it will consider the, um, the the primers within the same pool across segments so so you can do it basically as as is now um, but but it won't give you the full full ability to reduce dime, um, heterodimer formation you can in, in fact the, the ingra and um, who's on the call has actually pulled multiple schemes together for different viruses to make these sort of, sort of uh, sort of super pools um, and that's the sort of same idea as well, really, where you have multiple schemes in the same thing. It will work, but you're not able to exploit the advantages of minimizing the dime formation. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Winfred. What is the success rate of designing primal schemes for, for highly diverse uh, um, genomes or, 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 or populations? So it's better than it was. So that the idea with the with the new, um, the new, the, the recent version where it use where it can design primers against all all genomes, um, and make a you know make a little make a multi alignment against all of your input references has improved its ability to work on more diverse reference or more diverse reference sets um, compared to the previous version, but there is a limit to what you can do, and you're trying to design primers against a very large number of genomes or, or, or a very diverse group of reference genomes, it's not going to be possible to find fully conserved primers. So at a point, there will be a time where you, 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 should, you should consider other methods if you have that, if you have that, you know, if you have that um, application that you're trying to do. It's really good for um, single uh, viral strains. It's not so good against, you know, massive groups of diverse virus, you know, families. So that's the that's the that's the trade-off really of doing something that is high sensitivity but high, you know, but lack of sensitivity when things when things get more diverse. Yeah, and it's probably worth adding that 
it's the, the SARS-CoV-2 is an excellent use case in that regard because all of the genomes present share a very recent common ancestor of, of from about a year ago um, and actually very minimal genetic diversity um, has arisen during that time. So the scheme works very well. Um, Okay, um, two more questions. So thank you for all your good questions. Um, from Anna uh, Cusco, how do, the, how do the native barcoding protocol used here compare to um, the rapid uh, barcoding protocol? Is the main advantage um, the higher number of barcodes for the native, uh, therefore lower cost? Or is there, uh, are there other um, differences between those two protocols? Um, it's a good question. There isn't actually any, I think up until recently there was a difference in the number, but I think there is now 96, um, 96 rapid barcodes, or at least there is coming soon. But that's not the reason. The reason is because if you're doing um, rapid barcoding, you only get a, um, a five prime barcode. And we need uh, for this to, in order to get very, very high specificity demultiplexing which is required for this for this type of analysis you need to see um you know this you need to see two barcodes um a five prime and a three prime barcode and that's the reason that we use and we only we only use and nit, nit, and um, we'll come back to this in a minute but we actually only use the data which has got two barcodes for the analysis for that reason so it's because of that the other thing with with the rapid barcoding is that you'll fragment it even further. So we start off with 400 base pair, you'll go down um, even more. Um, and um, nanopore sequencing has a lower limit of, with the standard settings, in order for Guppy to base call a read, it needs to be, I think, 250 base pairs. So if you fragment, if you fragment your amplons, you'll lose to, um, quite a, a number of reads that become too short to base call. Um, as a secondary consideration. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and um, this point about double barcoding, um, I'm sure will be picked up in the next talk, as you say. Um, and we found that to be very important, um, particularly because of this issue of amplicon dropouts that you mentioned. Um, could you just elaborate what happened? If you have an amplicon dropout and you have in, in one sample, but not in another, and you have um, low barcoding specificity. Can you just elaborate on what might happen? Yeah, so this, <clears throat> this is quite an important point. And actually, if you do this right, nanopore, the nanopore demultiplexing is better than the alumina in, in terms of barcode hopping. And I say that with some confidence because obviously not only because in the alumina, um, in the alumina methods which use exclusion amplification, there's a known phenomenon of barcode hopping. Um, but even compared to the MySeq, it, it's, it's better. It's not uncommon to have um, you know, negative controls with zero demultiplex reads on Manipur, and that's you know, not, not gonna happen on, on any Illumina instrument. But um, the reason why it's very important is because you can, have, you can have very, very hard, very, very big differences in coverage over, over, over two or three logs you know, of difference in, in amplicon coverage between one region and the next due to the efficiency of that primer pair. Say if you compare the most efficient region, which, you know, might have, you might have tens of thousands of X coverage versus a dropout region, which might have zero. Um, if you consider that in a separate sample, those, those profiles might be inverted, then any amount of crosstalk from one sample to the other could lead you to think that there was, um, could lead you to see the minimum or to to get over the threshold of um, coverage in the incorrect sample leading to variant calls in that region where you shouldn't have called anything and that's why it's really important to have high highly um, stringent demultiplexing for this kind of work not only um, <clears throat> it's not only the really the efficiency of the of this of the regions it could be that you have a high CT sample and a low CT sample on the same run, and you're just can, and and the, the, the cross talk from your very high CT sample, or say your positive, sorry, your low CT sample, or your positive control could could um, could cr could hop in, you know, bar by barcode hopping could bleed across into your high CT sample or your negative, and then you'd see coverage there where you shouldn't see any coverage. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, 
uh, one last question, I think, and then we'll move to the next talk. Um, uh, what are the issues if you want to use primal scheme with non -vi viral genomes? And I guess you're thinking, uh, Majida, you're thinking about bacterial genomes, perhaps. Yeah, so the, 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 main, <clears throat> the main difficulty with, um, with bacteria is that you, you, you have a lot more where well, you have a, it's, you know, some of the key bacterial species and pathogens you might be interested in are high GC and, and that leads to more problems designing primers. So that was why we introduced the high GC mode. The reason um, you have to have different parameters for that is because high GC primers are a lot shorter than, than low GC primers because they have, um, you know, different kinetics. You could, you, you know, the TM difference is, is huge uh, in between a, um, you know, say like a high, a high GC, 70% um, GC organism compared to, to, you know, the in inverse. So we have to change all the parameters in terms of the, in terms of the primer length that are, that are permitted. Um, but yeah, you just, if you want to do that, turn on high GC mode and, 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 and it will select the other settings. If you have something which is sort of in between like 50, 55% GC, then you might have to try both and see which one gives you the best results.